Hi everyone, welcome and good evening. My name is Lauren Artilles and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, the Harvard University Division of Science and the Harvard Library, I'm honored to introduce this virtual event with Ritu Rahman, presenting her latest book, Biofabrication, in conversation with Jeremy Matthews. I hope everyone's week is going well. Thanks so much for joining us virtually tonight. Tonight's event is the latest installment in our Harvard Science Book Talk series, which works to bring the authors of recently published science literature to our Cambridge community and beyond. Coming up in the series next Tuesday, November 16th at 8 p.m., we'll host renowned musicologists Alexander Redding and Daniel K.L. Chua for their book, Alien Listening, Voyager's Golden Record and Music from Earth, moderated by Harvard's Melissa Franklin. To learn more about this and our other upcoming virtual events, you can visit harvard.com and sign up for our email newsletter or check out the page harvard.com backslash science for more info. We also have a Science Research Public Lectures YouTube channel where you can view previous talks you might have missed and I'll be sharing the link for that in the chat shortly. Today's discussion will conclude with some time for your questions. If you have a question for our authors at any time during the talk, just click on the Q&A button on your screen and we'll get through as many as time allows. In the chat, I'll be posting a link to purchase biofabrication on harvard.com, as well as a link to donate in support of this series and our store. Your purchases and financial contributions make events like tonight's possible and help ensure the future of a landmark independent bookstore. So thank you so much to our partners at Harvard University, and thank you to all of you for showing up and tuning in in support of authors, publishers, indie bookselling, and especially for science. And finally, as you may have experienced in previous virtual gatherings, technical issues may arise. If they do, we'll do our best to resolve them as quickly as possible. Thank you for your patience and understanding. And now I'm delighted to introduce tonight's speakers. Ritu Raman is the Darbalaf Career Development Assistant Professor of Mechanical Engineering at MIT. Her lab is centered on engineering adaptive living materials for application in medicine and machines. Professor Rahman has received several recognitions for scientific innovation, including being named a Kavli Fellow by the National Academy of Sciences and being named to the Forbes 30 Under 30 and MIT Technology Review 35 Innovators Under 35 lists. She's passionate about increasing diversity in STEM and has championed many initiatives to empower women in science, including being named an American Association for the Advancement of Science If Then Ambassador and founding the Women in Innovation and STEM database at MIT. Jeremy Matthews joined the MIT Press after working for nine years as a science writer and the book reviews editor for Physics Today magazine. He holds a bachelor's degree in chemistry and a master's and PhD degree in chemical engineering. His current focus is on trade books and textbooks in physics, astronomy, chemistry, material science, mechanicals, chemical, and civil engineering and mathematics. Tonight, they'll be discussing Ritu's new book, Biofabrication, part of the MIT Press Essential Knowledge series, in which she offers readers an accessible introduction to the science of building with living cells, like we've done for centuries with synthetic material. She explores tissue engineering, organs on a chip, lab-grown meat and leather, and biohybrid machines in depth as four ways in which biofabrication technology could re revolutionize aspects of our daily lives and illuminate the beauty and adaptiveness of our own biological machinery. Without further ado, I'm excited to turn things over to our speakers. The digital podium is yours, Ritu and Jeremy. Jeremy. Great, thank you so much for the kind introduction and for having us here today. Um, you know, the real purpose of this book was to share with as many people kind of the things that I find the most exciting and the most beautiful about this emerging discipline. Um, and so I hope that this can kind of give you a little bit of an introduction to the field and maybe get you a little bit excited about learning more. Um, so I wanted to start um, just by sharing a little bit of my motivation um, and how I got interested in this area in general, because I think when we see words like biofabrication, um, you know, apart from just questioning what does that even mean, you might wonder how does somebody go towards um, learning about something like that or even being interested by something like that in the first place. So before I even give you a definition um, of the word, I'm going to start with a little bit of a life story because I think it'll help you understand um, that process a little bit more. So I uh, grew up in India and Kenya and all over the United States, um, moved every couple of years. And actually, at this point, I've lived in Boston longer than anywhere else and kind of hoping to stay. 
Um, but, you know, the really interesting thing about growing up like that and, and moving around a lot and having that sort of instability is that you find stability in other places in your life. Um, so for me, that stability came in the form of my family, my mom, my dad, and my grandfather, all of whom are engineers. Um, chemical, mechanical, and civil engineer, respectively, and all of whom have this common trend of really just being very curious people that explore their environment, they observe things in their surroundings, and they think about how they can use their engineering skills to solve problems that they face. So part of my childhood was just kind of traveling to new and exciting places and really being very observant of my natural surroundings and, and indulging in that sort of scientific curiosity that we don't often see. Um, and part of it was seeing the impact that scientific innovation and engineering could really have on communities. Um, so one of my first memories growing up in Kenya, we used to live in the city most of the times during the weekdays, which is very much like life in Boston or anywhere else. You know, you go to school, you come home, you go to the grocery store on the weekends. There's nothing really different um, necessarily about that life. Um, but on the on the weekends, we would also sometimes go to some pretty remote villages where um, my parents would help build communication towers that would connect the village's communications infrastructure to um, big cities um, and the rest of the world. And this was a really early lesson for me because I saw um, that, you know, you can really have a significant impact on a community and environment, a positive impact that lasts over a long time if you use technological innovation um, as a force for positive social change. So these were some really driving influences in my early life. Um, and I got really interested in movement um, pretty early in my career at college. Um, and my first foray into the space was actually my very first job when I was about 17 or 18 years old. My first unpaid internship was in a biology lab and I had any interest in biology actually. And this video is cool, but a little distracting. So I'm gonna pause it for a second while I tell this story. But I was, I chose to be a mechanical engineering undergraduate student because I wanted to build cars and rockets and cool, exciting planes. Um, that's what I thought engineers do, right? They put together a bunch of different materials, metals, wood, ceramics, and they build these kinds of machines. That's what makes them exciting. Um, and I was an international student, so I couldn't really get any of the mechanical engineering internships that a lot of the folks in my classes were getting into. So I figured, all right, I guess I'll just have to be a little bit more creative. So the only job I could get one summer was um, an unpaid gig at a biology lab. I was doing it for the experience, you know, um, and they were really studying how diet and exercise could impact skeletal muscle function. So they were saying, you know, there's some kinds of diets that are known to cause skeletal muscle degenerations, things like if you drink a lot of alcohol, you're going to be basically wasting away and maybe that makes you a little bit weaker. And they also said, oh, well, you know, if you exercise a lot, we know you get a lot stronger. So what happens if you have a really terrible diet and you're exercising a lot? Do those things essentially even out? And the only way to really answer that question was to try it out in an experiment. And so I was the person responsible for feeding a bunch of different lab rats, different types of diets and putting them on treadmills and looking at, at what happened. Um, and initially, you know, it's just kind of bored because here you are sitting in a basement watching rats on treadmills and what are you really getting away from this experience? But as I spend more time there and as you spend more time in a basement by yourself with a bunch of rats, you start getting a little bit philosophical and you start saying, huh, isn't it interesting how you can really start seeing, right? You really start seeing that some of the rats are getting weaker. Some of them are getting stronger. Some of them are learning more quickly than others how to run on a treadmill. Um, and you see this dynamic adaptation to their environment. At the same time in my mechanical engineering classes, we're making robots and other things in our class, all the things that I thought I really wanted to do as an engineer. Um, and I was realizing that none of those robots could do anything halfway near as cool as these rats, right? Because as an engineer, you're always designing for some known specification. You say, I need a robot that goes in this direction this fast, and you build it to match that. And if something happens, say you need it to go faster, say you need it to go somewhere else, say a part breaks, 
you either have to fix that robot or build an entirely new robot. But with biological systems like rats and humans, um, we're constantly dynamically sensing and adapting to our environment. So that rat um, got better at using the treadmill in the same way that if I fell down and, and broke my leg today, eventually I would be able to heal that break in my leg. Um, but I could pick up my phone or my laptop right now and throw it across the room, which I wouldn't do. Um, but if I did, it would be broken and that would be the end of that, right? So there's a strong divergence in biological and non-biological or synthetic materials and machines. And I started wondering, you know, was it possible to start building machines using biological materials? And if we did that, would they have some of these innate, responsive, exciting, adaptive capabilities that biological systems have? which comes back to this video. So again, I'm very obsessed with kind of observing cool, new, interesting things in nature. And one of the most exciting things I've seen in my mom's garden, um, not all the exciting flowers that she says are very difficult to grow, um, but in fact, some of the, the living creatures that happen to live there. So this inchworm is doing something incredibly interesting. It might not look super exciting to you, but you can see that it's navigating along the precarious edge of a leaf, really sensing its way around this ed edge of a leaf in a way that none of the most fancy, exciting million dollar robots that we've been putting, you know, so much research dollars and efforts and technical expertise into can do, you know, they can walk across the ground and sometimes they can do cool things like jump or maybe they can recover from a stumble but we are nowhere close to this. And that's because biological systems have the ability to sense a whole range of different signals in their environment, process it in a pretty complex way and make a decision about what they're going to do. So I got really excited about, you know, could we make robots that kind of mimicked this inchworm-like structure by using biological materials and machines. Um, I won't go too much into the science of that, but essentially we would make muscle in the lab, wrap it around a little skeleton that kind of looked like a worm. So this is a side view of what the little worm looks like. And we would genetically engineer them. So every time we shine light on the muscle, it would contract and we could get a little worm that kind of inched along the surface. The first thing we wanted to do was just prove that we could get that muscle to contract every time we shine light on it. We're like, okay, we got it. We can do that. Um, and then the second thing we did was say, okay, now that we know that maybe we can shine light on one leg or another leg and get the robot to move in one direction or another direction. And then we showed that as well. So we started making these sort of creepy crawly inchworm like robots that were powered by living biological muscle. And we started seeing right away that they were able to do things that regular robots couldn't do. So they were able to do things like exercise and get stronger. We showed that we could get them to heal from damage and just have a whole bunch of other um, capabilities that that traditional robots couldn't do, and it was entirely because they were made out of biological materials. So that was kind of the foundation for my research and what I was doing. And I met Jeremy um, fairly early in my career before I was a professor at MIT and, and still a, a postdoc. Um, and, you know, sharing the stuff about my work. And he said, well, this is very interesting. Um, it would be really great to kind of share with more people this kind of work that's being done. But what are other things that we might be able to build with biological materials like living cells? And what kind of impact um, would that have on everyday people? Should we care about this? Should we learn more about it? Um, so I took some time to, to really think about this and figured, yeah, you know, robotics is this great application for this type of work, but there are many other applications that are hopefully going to impact our lives in positive ways in the future. Um, so we'll dive into these a little bit more, um, maybe during the question and answer kind of um, session, but we talk I talk in the book about, you know, you could, if you know how to build with biological materials like living cells, you could put them together to form a certain type of tissue or organ system so that if you lose a large chunk of muscle or some other portion of tissue in your body due to disease or damage, um, you would be able to replace that. You could also use it as kind of a test bed um, for a variety of different diseases and, and potential new medications or therapies for those diseases. So that rather than testing something first in lab rats and then elaborate clinical trials that might cost billions of dollars and maybe have a chance of succeeding, could we create really good mimics of 
human beings and certain components of human tissues in the lab that we can quickly test a wide variety of therapies and, and see their impact. And then we also could think about, well, sometimes you don't want something that mimics a worm. You don't want something that mimics a human. You want something that mimics other kinds of animals so that you can eat them. Um, and I'm vegetarian, so I don't do that super often slash ever. Um, but, you know, there are a lot of people, I think, um, that know that this is a really important part of their diet, but are also maybe concerned about some of the maybe environmental issues or maybe some ethical questions about you know, large scale animal, animal farming. But it's also a big part of their diet. So they're not willing to just replace that or change that right away. And so the question becomes, can we start saying, well, if you can make meat that's living, you can, or make muscle that's living, you can make muscle that's not living, right? And that's what we call meat. Um, and so we can start thinking of this field called cellular agriculture, where you're essentially patterning biological materials and cells together into things that have the look and taste and feel and texture of meat because they essentially are meat. Um, and we ask questions about, does this have a, an impact ethically? Does it have an impact environmentally? And this really kind of the last part of the book after talking about all of these different applications in medicine and robotics and agriculture really says, Will this have a positive impact on our environment? Will it have a negative impact on our environment? Can we know that? How can we plan for that going ahead? Um, and then also ask them the ethical questions about, you know, when you're building with things like living cells, you know that the materials you're building with are technically living, but that doesn't necessarily always mean that the thing that you're building is alive or has the moral consideration of a living being in some way. So we really walk through some philosophical kind of thought experiments of how we might go about thinking about that idea um, or set of ideas and, and how we might make more responsible decisions. Um, not only as scientists, but as an overall community that's engaged with this field of research. Um, and yeah, I mean, that's, that's the, the book. We'll dive into a little bit, a little bit more with Jeremy, but, um, my real goal here, um, both with the book and with sharing it with other people is just saying that, you know, I think biofabrication is, it's growing. It's a really rapidly changing field. It's probably going to affect some aspect of your life in the coming years. And so I really hope this book kind of serves as a quick guide to how this technology might impact your life in good ways. Um, and also hopefully give you a better understanding and empower you to help decide how biofabrication helps us shape the world that we live in. That was a great uh, overview, Ritu. And thank you for inviting me to do this with you. Thank you to the Harvard Bookstore. And thank you to everyone who's here now. And I have a copy of the book, uh, I'm blurred, so too, <laughs> you're not gonna see it clearly, but I do have a copy of Ritu's book, book right now. Uh, Ritu, when you started, you mentioned that you wanted to do engineering and build rockets and other huge machines, but I think a lot of people don't realize that the cell is a machine, mm -hmm. right? And so um, can you maybe talk a little bit about, for, for those who are, still have that mindset that engineering is built in with you know mechanical things that aren't living how this is engineering yeah yeah that's a that's a really great question um one of the first kind of diagrams that i put up when i give a scientific talk often to anybody it could be undergrads could be any scientist in any field is to literally break apart um, a biological system like say the inchworm that I, I showed um, into a block diagram. So I say, what's really happening here, right? You have something that's sensing some visual cues in its environment. Maybe it's light, maybe it's electricity, maybe it's chemical, maybe it's feeling how bouncy that leaf is or how much wind is blowing. And then all of that sensory information, it goes into another block or black box and that's processing. So what that means is it's making, taking all this input information and making some sort of decision. It's gonna say, this is what I'm going to do. And then there could be a whole range of output responses. It could be, I'm gonna move over there. I'm gonna change color. I'm gonna get bigger. 
I'm going to secrete some weird chemical that's going to let people know this is my leaf. You know, all of these things are potential output responses that could happen. And usually there's some feedback into the system as well. So that's how I would describe as an engineer this inchworm that is basically a, an organism that's made of many cells that are talking to each other. But that's also potentially how I could describe my phone, right? You know, it's sensing some different signals from its environment. It's processing them in some way. That's what it makes it cost a thousand dollars i guess there's all these chips back there making all kinds of decisions and computations and then it's doing things like changing color it's changing the light brightness it's changing the sounds it emits and i'm taking that and feeding that back into the system so it's exactly the same thing all of the things are the same um the difference is that biology happens to be really good at that internal processing um, and that feedback so what can we learn from that and apply it to our engineered systems is, is really kind of that central tenet of, of biofabrication. Yeah, I mean, when I was studying engineering, chemical engineering many, many years ago, I used to, when we were studying reactor design, we realized that biology of most biological systems, all biological systems are essentially rea reactor systems. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I wanna pull the, uh, the listeners into what the book is about and how it connects to them. So I'm gonna start where you ended, talking about the ethics and, and maybe, maybe the global applications, right? Of something like building fabricated meat, right? So how much of an impact can what is happening in biofabrication have on the world today? Or are these things several years away? For example, making meat that can maybe reduce agricultural um, impact on negative impact on the earth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, what's funny is when I, it's such a rapidly changing field that when I first started writing this book, I was like, yeah, you know, I think maybe you'll have something like this in a few years. And if the ethical and regulatory considerations happen, yada, yada. And then it went out for editing and review and copy editing. And by the time I got the final proof for the book, I was like, actually, this is already happening in Singapore right now. Like you can go by lab grown meat. It has regulatory approval um, and you can eat it. So isn't that crazy <laughs> how quickly um, that can happen? Now, the question becomes, you know, sure, maybe you can do that in some country or if you pay a lot of money or in this right. very niche restaurant, but is it really going to impact what you do in the grocery store in five years? Um, and I think that really comes to the question of two things. One, being affordably at a price point that's really accessible for a lot of different people. Um, and two, does it make sense to do that? You know, you're getting some value, not only in terms of the product itself, um, but also maybe hopefully maybe in terms of some ethical considerations you have about the environment or something else. So you are getting some value from this product. And so I think meat is one of those consumer products that has could capture many of those elements for people. So on the one hand, if you're saying, okay, for whatever reason, I have a problem with traditionally farmed meat. Um, so I wanna buy something at around the same price point that either doesn't involve you know, killing animals or doesn't involve growing animals in these very um, you know, large scale farms or something like that. And you can't afford really organic cruelty-free animals for whatever reason. So at that point, if we could build you meat, essentially like print a steak or manufacture a burger um, that was made out of cells, the same cells that would have come from a cow or a pig or another animal that you were going to eat. And it would essentially have the taste, the look, the texture, the smell um, of the meat you were gonna eat. You wouldn't really see the difference because all you see is that process end product. And you might even have some advantages. So because it's not coming from a living being and is being processed and made in a lab where you can really control a lot of environmental um, factors, you might not have as much risk of potential contamination to the meat. You might not have um, issues related to, you know, any bacteria that are maybe hitching a long ride. And you could even have meat where they've, you know, maybe added a couple extra elements or vitamins or amino acids that you might need and don't usually get um, to make the actual product 
a lot more, you know, synthesized to your dietary needs, or you could have something that's say a little bit less fatty than you would otherwise get from that animal. Um, so a leaner version of a product that wouldn't naturally happen. And so there are some potential advantages there. There's even some maybe culinary advantages or you can cook it in certain ways or maybe mix cells from different animals together and make some sort of product that would not otherwise be possible. So you could make, you know, many kind of interesting consumer-based arguments. Um, and then you could also make an environmental argument saying, well, a lot of the energy that goes into making meat is actually into growing up an animal to the size where you could take a piece of it and it looks like, you know, the meat that you might consume. So all of that meat is going into keeping this animal alive for this period of time that you don't even really see it. And then a lot of the parts of the animal aren't even being eaten most of the time. So there's a huge amount of waste. So if you could reduce the amount of energy, um, like literal energy that it takes to make a steak or a burger. Um, and also the fact that you're not actually having to move livestock across the country or around the world, right? You're just making exactly what you need and only shipping that and only storing that. There's a real argument, I think, to be made that it could be at least net neutral um, or perhaps uh, a little bit better than traditional farming. And the, and the book walks through a lot of different calculations on, on how we might um, think about that sort of thing. But that's certainly one of the probably most easily and, and more quickly accessible consumer applications of biofabrication. So another applica application you mentioned in the book is organs on a chip. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I think that should resonate with people is maybe it has potential for helping with medical, you know, and, and even maybe things related to endemics or yeah, pandemics even um, are there. What are the applications for organ and organs on a chip? Yeah, this is, I think, a really interesting application because I think it, again, falls along the thing of, is this something that might have some impact on people outside of science in their either ethical or financial concerns in some way? So, you know, most of us might know, especially because of the pandemic, that every medication we've taken, whether over the counter or a vaccine for COVID, um, it involved a huge effort to bring that from the lab, right? So there's some biologists that sat around and figured out what is the exact mechanism that's disrupted in a disease, and then a bunch of chemists found some sort of compound compound that could take that disease mechanism and like mix it back to its healthy state. And then engineers are kind of helping saying, how do we deliver these compounds to the right person in the right side of the body at the right time? And so all of that drug development will get to a certain point in living cells, and then you'll do it in a bunch of animals that are as close as possible um, to the human state. And then eventually you do have to run a clinical trial, and, and that comes with a lot of risk and expense, and, and not a lot, of, a, lot, a lot of times it just doesn't work, right? So on average, you might have a drug that gets to market and it might take two or $3 billion or even more for some of the more complicated types of drugs to get to a person. And then you have these large costs um, that we all have to shoulder. So it comes back to this question of, are there ways that we can make this process not only cheaper, but also more effective. You know, a lot of these drugs that are being developed do fail and they don't work for a lot of different people and they're not personalized to the needs of the individual. So it's not just about making something that's cheaper and more accessible, but also making something that's net better um, for all of us. So organs on a chip, there's developed for a whole range of different organs. It could be something like muscle, it could be the lung, it could be the brain. And all you're really saying is there is a disease that affects X inside the body. So I'm going to make a really tiny version of it, tiny enough that I can make it for cheap. I can make a whole bunch of them and I can test what happens when I do this to it or that to it or this to it. Um, and I can do that quite quickly and cheaply, but it's not so tiny that it's not representative of the organ as a whole. So it, it's some basic small functional unit um, that still represents in some meaningful way, this larger organ system that I'm trying to replicate inside the body. So then you can go in and you say, this is what happens in the disease. I'm gonna make this little, say I you know, have regular healthy muscle. I might take cells from somebody who has some sort of um, genetic disorder. So they have a lot of muscle weakness. So then I can make a little muscle that kind of replicates their muscle tissue. And then I can try a whole bunch of therapies. I can say, oh, well, when I tried this, they didn't really respond, but when I tried that, they do respond. And so now let's maybe try it in that person and then see what happens, right? And so there's a lot of different people working on different aspects of different organs, different tissue types, different types of diseases. And there's even some folks thinking about 
well, there's some things that are systemic, right? You know, there's a reason that um, cancer, like if we knew that we could just put a chemotherapy on a tumor and it kills all of the tumor cells, we'd be like, yeah, that's fine. We should just shove a whole bunch of this in a person. But we've learned over time that it actually has a negative effect on the other cells in somebody's body, right? So we have started going into this realm of people taking, here's an organ on a chip for muscle, here's one for brain, here's maybe one for the liver, kind of linking them up into a little body-like structure and saying, what are the multi-systemic impacts that might have? A certain drug might have and is it safe and efficacious to give this drug to somebody so i'm going to go into another chapter that maybe is more uh, familiar to people tissue engineering can you talk about the history of tissue engineering how it connects to some of these more futuristic or uh, i would say uh, further down the line in terms of development type of type of applications mm-hmm. Yeah, I think tissue engineering is the sort of thing that one of the it's probably one of those things that you see in science fiction books and things all of the time, even if they don't call it tissue engineering, is basically what if you had a heart attack or what if you lost a leg and somebody could just go and essentially say, well, I'd like to print off a new copy of Virtu's heart and her arm, please. And they would take it and they just shove it right into me and I'd be good to go and, and back at whatever peak performance I was at before, right? So this is kind of a holy grail of medicine in a lot of ways. And we've always been obsessed with animals like salamanders and jelly, it's starfish and all these things that can regenerate because we're afraid. We're afraid of getting sick. We're afraid of some sort of permanent disability that we might have to take with us. And of course, we're afraid of dying. Um, so we're always trying to prevent or at least Pro, like prolong the quality um, of our life for as long as possible. So tissue engineering is really wrapping in on this aspect. So if organ on a chip is saying, how can I make a really tiny version of my organ that I you know, can perturb in some way, the tissue engineering side is saying, okay, now I wanna make an actual organ sized version of that thing. And you might say, well, if you can make a little piece of it, why can't you just make a big piece of it? And in theory, that makes sense. Really, you're just, if you can put a bunch of cells together in this shape, you should be able to put a bunch of cells together in this shape. But cells are just really finicky and hard to work with, right? So you have these, you might have a hundred different cell types that go into a tissue or organ um, this big. They're all arranged in this very precise architecture. You might need micrometer level control to put the right cell in the right place. You need blood vessels, you might need an immune system, you have a bone that's going through there. So really to capture all of this, building that is very, very complex. The manufacturing technology that you would need, the infrastructure you would need to keep all of the cells alive during that process, and also the infrastructure you'd need to grow that many cells. That would be billions and billions of cells. And if you're putting inside a person, you probably wanna use their own cells. So you would say, go up to them, you'd scrape off a bit of their skin and you would those skin cells and you would de-differentiate them, you send for the stem cell-like state to get to something called induced pluripotent stem cells. And now you can say, okay, I have these stem cells and I can make them into skin, I can make them into muscle, I can make them into this kind of brain cell. So now you need to make these hundred different cells and you need to grow up billions of each of those. And then you need to take all of them and put them into this 3D architecture, right? So it gets very complex very quickly. And so it's something that, you know, the field has been working towards for a long time, but you can see that really the way we have to work to it is by saying there are some folks who are working on how do we get stem cells to go to all these different types of fates, all these different types of cells there could be. And there are other folks, so that's more maybe in the biology realm. And there might be folks in the engineering, the chemical engineering, the processing folks saying, okay, how do I make a factory or a bioreactor that can take these stem cells and make a billion of those um, in five minutes because this person's dying. So I kind of need that heart right now. Um, and not five minutes, but you know what I mean? Um, so, you know, you're, it's just, it's all of these technical challenges are occurring, they're maturing, but they're happening kind of separately. They're happening in tandem. And so when are we going to get to the point that we can put all these things together? It really depends for some of the less complex tissues like cartilage, um, sooner rather than later, but when you get to something really complex or really difficult to grow, um, like say the eye, um, you might be looking at a, at a longer time span. Mm. Uh, now let's talk a little bit about the work that you're doing in your new lab. Congratulations, by the way. Uh, I know that's going to be quite a, a lot of work to build it up. Uh, what's one exciting project 
I'm sure you're working on more than one, but what's one exciting project that you'd like to share with us? Yeah, um, so one of the most exciting things, you know, the kind of little robots that I showed the videos of, they were just powered by muscles. So you kind of can just turn them on or off and they're just kind of like boop, 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 and they crawl this way or they crawl that way. And that's very exciting. They're the first robots of their kind, very proud of them and happy that they can do what they do. But at the end of the day, um, I'm still obsessed with that inchworm that's showing me off on belief, right? I want to create something that's at least getting a little bit closer to that, if not as good. And so what that really tells you is that there's some parts that are missing. We're not just using muscle to generate force. If we, all of our muscles were just twitching all of the time, you know, we wouldn't be able to do anything, but I can do something like pick up this pen and I can pick up this rubber band and I know how to hold them in different ways. And this is kind of slippery. So I know how to hold onto it a little bit tighter. So actually what's happening is two things. Not only um, am I controlling which muscles I turn on and how much I turn them on, but I'm also sensing something. I'm sensing, oh, this is not that heavy. I don't actually need to put that much force into lifting it up, but it is kind of slippery. So maybe I'll hold it like this so that it's less likely to fall through. So all of those kind of computations, right? They're not necessarily happening consciously. Um, you are sensing something um, you're sensing the rate and degree of stretch in your muscle or some kind of, um, you know, tactile sensation in your fingers and your body, your spinal cord is sending some signals to your muscles saying, this guy, you contract here, this guy, you need to relax a little bit. So this guy can contract a little bit more. So all of those computations are happening and they're happening because of neurons. So there are motor neurons that are essentially the, the neurons that are telling your muscle, turn on, turn off, don't do this, do this. Um, and their sensory neurons, they're saying, oh, you're stretching a lot right now, buddy, like maybe a little too much yoga or you're sense run, you know, stretching quite quickly. So maybe slow down a little bit. So they're sensing the rate and degree of stretch. They're communicating with the motor neurons that are telling the muscle to turn on or off. And these cells are all kind of working in synchrony to create some of the more complex behaviors that we see, right? It's still not everything because um, really you could travel all the way up the spinal cord to our brain and realize there's some planning and coordination and learning that ha that's happening. But even just to get to partway to that complexity is going to be very difficult. So what we're working on in the lab is saying we can do muscle. Um, so the next step is to work on motor and sensory neurons and, and how do we bring them into our robots. Okay. Well, I'm going to take uh, questions from the audience in a few minutes. So if you have any questions, please put them in into the Q&A. Uh, but I, I want to talk a little bit uh, going back before uh, you actually got to where you are now as a MIT professor. Uh, you mentioned that most, if not all, the closest people in your life are engineers. Didn't that at all tempt you to go in the opposite direction? How did, how, how did you end up an engineer just like them? Yeah, I think, you know what it is? I think if my parents had been very insistent that I do that, I probably would have been like, no, I refuse. <laughs> um, but my parents, you know, they, it was kind of like open, you could do whatever you wanted. And I was good at a lot of things like English. I, I enjoyed it. I enjoy reading and writing, which should not come as a surprise to you. Um, I enjoyed music and history and all of the things. So I think, you know, one thing that's really important early in life is to take the chance to explore a lot of different fields. Um, for me, I think part of my fascination with engineering and science was just this concept of exploration and also the willing the feeling that I wanted to do something that had some kind of meaningful, positive impact um, on other people. It just seemed like the only way to have a purposeful life to me. And the easiest example was just seeing the people I know that I also have to get along with my parents really well. Um, you know, I, I felt like they were having a positive impact on their environment. So when I said it, I was like, I'm going to do this and I think I'm going to be an astronaut. They were like, really? You sure you don't want to be like a journalist or writer? It seemed like that's kind of your thing. Um, and I was like, sure, maybe I can do that in the future, but I really think I'm going to do this now. Um, so that's that's how that worked out. And, and luckily, um, you know, writing has has not left my life. Um, so I think that's a that's a good sign. <laughs> yeah, we're grateful for that. Uh, you know, and Lauren just posted in the chat purchase biofabrication. So I agree with that. And I actually was going to ask you, Ritu, what impacts has books had on your life, your professional life? and not only your professional life, but your uh, your desire and your interest in science communication and science advocacy. 
Yeah, I think, you know, there's a few different kinds of ways that books and scientific books in general can really um, impact minds of, of all ages. On the one hand, um, I'm somebody partially because I was moving from school to school and, and country and continent to continent. Um, sometimes I wasn't always clicking with the way that instruction was happening in a classroom because it just wasn't a good cultural fit or maybe I didn't literally speak the same language as the people who were talking to me. And so for me, face-to-face -face classroom instruction has never been a very helpful mode of learning. And a lot of the ways that I learned pretty much everything I know um, was to read a lot of different books because eventually you'll find, you might, you might read some book and say, I don't really understand neuroscience the way this person explains it. But there's gonna be somebody somewhere who speaks your language, who can explain things in a way you understand. Um, and that impact can travel across countries and it can travel across decades, right? We can pick up a book that somebody wrote ages ago and still get a great amount of, of meaning from that. So I think from a scientific and educational perspective, that's great. And then also from an imagination perspective, Perspective. When you're a researcher, you're going out and saying, what is the new science I can do that's never been done before? And for me, a lot of that inspiration comes from things like superhero books. I mean, you and I have worked yeah. on some comic book type projects together as well, um, encouraging girls in science. But, you know, superhero comics and all those kinds of books, they really allow us to ask some of these questions like, oh, if you could you know, replace somebody's tissue? Or what if you've, instead of replacing somebody's muscle, you gave them super strong muscle and then they became super strong? What kind of ethical implications would they have? What responsibility do they have to their community? What can we do as a society to maybe limit the negative impact they could have on us? And we allow these sort of fictional fantasies to play out, but then as scientists who want to do ethical work that has a positive impact on us, on our societies, we can really learn a lot from those stories, right? And we can apply that to our own work and use that to spark our imagination and also keep our imagination in check. Um, so I think books have a tremendous role to play in the development of scientists. So Ritu, you, you mentioned a book that we worked on together. It's called the Curie Society, and the authors of that book tapped uh, Ritu to advise on the book, not only on the science but on the character development. And that, you know, that leads me to ask you about the role of um, women like you and scientists in general, and what role they can play, or you all can play, in really making science and STEM more inclusive. And that, that book, The Curie Society, really has a strong component of this STEM is for girls, STEM is for everyone, uh, no matter your, your and, and it's for girls who like to dress up and girls who like to be tomboyish. Uh, I know there may be a, a different word for that now, but uh, yeah, it's for everyone. So can you talk a little bit about your, your thoughts on that? Yeah, you know, I think hopefully the takeaway from this book and any kind of research talk I give is science is really hard and there's a lot of questions remaining to be answered. And so probably the best thing we can do as a society if we really want to experience the positive impacts of this on our lives as quickly as possible. It's sure that as many people who want to work on this are working on this, right? There's no reason to limit the, the STEM workforce um, other than you just want to hold yourself back from the next awesome new phone or medical technology, which I don't know why you would want to do. Um, so I am really, really passionate about um, expanding the representation of people who are interested in, in STEM. I focused a lot of my efforts on encouraging, not even really encouraging girls and women to support this, to pursue science. I actually think that girls are very excited about science. It's just they're often not encouraged to continue um, once they've mentioned that interest. They're usually said, well, that's not really something, or they receive a lot of implicit cues about that not really being the place to, to go. So I try to be very explicit about saying that, you know, they're needed and welcome, and we need a lot of different kinds of perspectives in science. And I think, again, books have a great role to play in this because Somebody might look at me and say, I really connect with her and I can see myself being a scientist like her and that's great. Somebody else might be like, that girl is a little bit annoying. I don't really wanna do what she does. Um, so they're gonna need to see a different type of scientist and a different type of role model that speaks to them, right? So books and TV shows and other kinds of media, um, they really have a way of showing us different types and ways of being a scientist and you connect with what you connect with and, and hopefully that leads you on your own path of discovery. Yeah, that makes sense. Let me dip into some of the questions. The first one that came in had to do with, uh, I think it had to do a little bit with talking about uh, printed meat, basically. 
Uh, given our just-in-time economy, if we industrialize this biological manufacturing, are there downsides to strain in certain resources? Uh, what resources are required to build competitive advantages in, in our economy? So do you want to touch a little bit on that? I know that's beyond maybe the scope of not only this book, but maybe what you, what you focus on. Yeah, I think, well, one part of this that I do want to focus on is this idea of competitive advantage in our economy, right? Because it's a, it's an ongoing part of the debate is saying like, oh, there have been other situations where we've maybe, at least in America, relinquished part of our manufacturing capabilities to other places. And so is this something where we can really take leadership and advance? And I think Certainly, since a lot of the exciting research um, is being done globally, but a lot of it is being done here, um, there's a lot of cool new technology and infrastructure we can build around really owning this biomanufacturing economy and, and taking a lead there. But beyond that, I, I also think one aspect I really care about is education, not only education in the form of this book, but we have, you know, I started my own classes that I teach at MIT and at Illinois, where I did my PhD, where we teach everybody like from teenagers to say, here's how you would build your own biological robot powered by living muscle and give people these kinds of skills. And that's great to do at the college level, but what I think I would really like to do in the future is to make these kinds of tools and trainings accessible uh, to people at any point in their career. Um, because when we evolve new economies or new sciences or new ways of manufacturing, we have to make sure that we're also training workforces um, in a more equitable way. So that's certainly something that I think, you know, a way that we could build competitive advantage into our economy is to empower both people and the infrastructure to deal with these challenges. The same questioner asked, what role did biofabrication play perhaps in this the rapid ramp up for COVID vaccines? Do you know anything about that? I know a little bit in that my postdoc advisor is the co-founder of Moderna. Um, so I'm not a scientific expert in that field by any means. Um, but certainly something I've learned through that process is realizing that some of the early experiments in our lab that led to the delivery technologies that enable the vaccines actually started about 40 years ago. So it shows you kind of a lot of the time and effort and energy that it takes to take something from basic science to something that can get in your arm um, at, a, at a local pharmacy, right? And, and that biomanufacturing has taken a really long time to develop, and we've certainly pushed it a lot in the last year out of necessity, but it took a long time and a lot of investment on the front end to, to get to that point. Um, so, you know, I think there's been a lot of improvements. We have to make sure that we are thinking long-term when we think about how to enable this kind of um, manufacturing, but I'm, I'm not happy the pandemic happened, but I am glad that so many people have seen um, the impact that this kind of research, this basic scientific research and investment can have on their lives, hopefully in a positive way. And hopefully that'll incentivize people to, to get more excited about science in the future. Yeah. Uh, someone asked about potential applications that didn't make it into the book. Uh, are, are there any that you could think of right now? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I think that um, those were all of my ideas. No, I think there's a lot of cool <laughs> things that either I haven't thought of or that are in very early days. You know, we talk a little bit, for example, about if you can grow meat, you could also maybe potentially grow other types of animal products like leather. Um, and you could also think beyond mammalian cells, so cells from mammals and say, can we start building with plant cells or, or building with insect cells and what new kinds of applications might that enable? It could be something like architecture, right? We could make sustainable, more sustainable or greener buildings by building with plant cells and other kinds of um, living technologies that adapt to their environment as well. So I think if I had more um, expertise in that area or perhaps more research had been done there or more time, um, I would have loved to write more on that plant side of, of biofabrication. Yeah. Uh, someone asked if you have, if you ever collaborate with synthetic biology, biologists. Yeah, yeah, all the time. So, you know, doing things like when we're asking, can we build a biology? Sometimes, like in the case of medical applications, we're saying, well, I just want to take something and recreate exactly what exists inside the body. But for some of the applications like robotics, you're saying, actually, I want to push this even further and I want to do something that's slightly different from biology. And that's where genetic engineering tools that synthetic biologists use all the time become really handy. So, for example, 
the robot that I showed you where we were flying, you know, flashing a light on it, that was only possible because normally if I flash my, a light on my muscle, nothing's going to happen, right? Hopefully. Um, but if we genetically engineer the muscle to respond in, in, um, response to light stimulation, you can get that muscle to contract. And that, that only happens as a result of synthetic biology tools. So we're constantly working with synthetic biologists to ask like, how are ways that we can tweak our cells to maybe do things they wouldn't naturally do, but that we might need in our biofabricated machine or system. So um, how, how close are we to making these, these things adapt beyond what we program them to do? Yeah, I mean, I think on some sense, they're already kind of doing that, right? I can, they do get stronger when they are subjected to more strenuous environments. Um, they do heal from damage. So in that sense, they are doing it. The question becomes, there are some more like complex behaviors, say like learning, like maybe there's a robot, we're teaching it how to navigate a maze. How do we get to something that maybe says, I've done this maze yesterday. Um, so I know that this right turn is a dead end, right? And so for that, you need something like memory and learning. And that really comes when you not only have muscle, you not only have the nerves in your spinal cord that are sensing, you know, how much you're stretching or what you turn on, but you need the neurons that are up here um, in your brain, in your motor cortex that are really doing a lot of that planning and, and memory. Um, so that uh, good question. <laughs> maybe, maybe 20 years, maybe more. Um, we're still doing it. So sometimes it just takes longer and you kind of have to roll with the punches. Okay. I'm going to try to get to all the questions because, um, you know, I really appreciate the people who came and, and were willing to ask questions. Someone asked a question I had, which is what impact do you think this type of research and maybe your research in particular have on maybe space exploration, human space ex exploration to the moon or Mars or habitation in space. Uh, do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, I mean, I think on the, in all realms, medicine, agriculture, and robotics, there are potential applications in space, right? So for a medical realm, you could say what happens to things like muscle or other tissues when they are they have prolonged exposure to environments where there isn't gravity or other kinds of very extreme um, situations. From an agriculture perspective, there aren't farms in space. So how are we going to make food up there? And are there ways that maybe we could just take a bank of cells and be expanding them and making um, meat as needed or other kinds of food as needed from scratch um, in that environment? And then from a robotics perspective, there might be situations where you're like, well, I don't really know what's going on over there. I need to map out that crater or figure out, you know, I need to send something over there. Drone maybe doesn't make sense because I need some ground information. So you might want to send out a robot to go explore this new territory. And you want something that's as responsive to its environment as possible. So it doesn't just balk at the first pothole, fall over, break, and then not do anything again, right? So hopefully a bio robot could be useful in that application. So I think across all of the potential realms of application, there's some really um, significant impact that it could have in the future in space. Uh, I'm not sure I understand the, this question, but it says, are the living muscles fed um, with nutrients? So I think maybe, you know, energy, right? Food is energy. So how, how do these systems get energy? Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, so typically we show these videos and what you don't see is all of the stuff around the video. So you see the robot um, and I'm distracting you with all the lights and the cool colors. Um, but what I'm not showing you is that that robot is sitting in a big bath of liquid. And that big bath of liquid is basically warm sugar water. It's got some amino acids and other stuff in it, but that's essentially its food. It's basically metabolizing sugar in its environment. It's converting that into a form of energy it can use and convert into the mechanical energy of contraction. Um, so that's how we feed the muscles right now um, and how we feed a lot of cells when we're growing them in these sort of lab environments. Um, and the question becomes, how do we essentially convert those into something that looks a little bit more like a battery or something that you can either carry around? Maybe it's flowing the way blood flows through our veins. Maybe it's flowing um, through these tissues. So all of these um, kind of how do we take that, that liquid and convert it into a biochemical battery is a, is a big challenge that we're definitely working on addressing right now. But it's huge because if you don't have energy, you don't have anything. So um, someone asked a really, a really good question, which is how did you manage to do, write a book during your postdoc while you were applying for faculty positions 
and I and I got the I got the sense of how difficult it was. But yeah, how did you structure your time and were able to finish it? And I'm happy you did. <laughs> <laughs> Well, part of it was that there was a pandemic. I couldn't go anywhere. Um, and, um, not everything happens at the same time, right? Um, but no, I mean, the real answer is that um, it's really nice when your creative endeavors, things like writing and sharing stories in a way that's accessible to a lot of people, also happen to align a little bit with your work, but not too much, right? So you feel like you're taking a break from writing your research or going in lab and pipetting or writing your faculty grant proposal by talking about the stuff that's maybe vaguely, I don't do anything related to me. So it's interesting for me to learn about this and write about this in an interesting way. Um, but when you're doing that, you are learning something. You are immersing yourself in that world. And over time, things start to click. And so there are many different things, you know, that's just in the writing realm, but maybe I'm playing a piano. Maybe I'm going for a run. There's a lot of different things that you can do for yourself um, that only not only make you feel better and make you feel more fulfilled, but give you time to kind of process information that's happening in other aspects of your life. So I think, yeah, there's there are times when you can do too much that everything is distracting and you don't get anything done. But sometimes you find the right balance where these different activities are actually synergistic and make you more productive than you would have been if you were only doing one thing. And, and as you know, I'd be happy for you to write another book, but I'm not gonna put that pressure on you. You have a lot on your plate right now. So let me get to two more questions. Um, which businesses are receptive to the out of the box thinking of biofabrication? So uh, I think this person is saying they don't, they haven't seen actual industrial applications outside of pharmaceuticals uh, and maybe robotics. Are there mm -hmm. other industries that are invested in biofabrication? Yeah, you know, I think for sure um, the medical realm is is very excited in this space, but there are, you know, for example, the agriculture space, I would say, is actually picking up steam a lot because now that it's passed regulatory approval in Singapore, it shows that consumers are actually willing to try this kind of product and can safely adopt it. And it's still at an accessible enough price point that many people can get to it. So I think you'll start seeing more of that, more interesting types of meats and other consumer products like leathers. Um, I think with the robotic stuff, you'll definitely see it eventually. The issue is that it's the most technologically young. It's the most technologically early. We have so much work to do to get there. So I think some of the early applications might be um, in the in, in industrial complexes like you know military research um, or basic scientific academic research. We're really just trying to understand the design rules and principles of how this works. But hopefully, eventually, you'll get to a place where you'll have your Boston Dynamics robots, and then you'll have some Boston bio robots too. And besides military, what about space exploration or deep sea exploration? I mean, are those places that could, where you could test out some of these systems? Yeah, yeah. You know, sometimes I kind of roll all of that into defense because I think exploration and defense have been very tied in, in the yeah. American infrastructure for a long time. But for sure, I think, you know, any kind of the, the national research agencies that we have, whether, you know, they're militarily oriented or more exploration oriented like NASA, um, I think there could definitely be an impact and an interest there. Yeah. And uh, the last question, uh, what advice would you have for a young person, maybe particularly a young girl who's hoping to pursue a career in STEM? And I like that you said, hey, you don't want people to do STEM. You wanted to say you can do STEM if you can, if you choose to, but someone who's chosen it, what advice would you give them? Yeah, you know, I think a lot of times, um, especially in America, we tend to get this advice of like, follow your dreams or follow your passion. It's very hard to know what that is early on in your life. And also some of the ideas you have in your early life are silly. And like, maybe that passion isn't actually going to lead to a job. And honestly, to be frank, most of the time you need a job to buy a house and grow food and do all the things that you need to do. So I, I like to give people more practical advice by saying, you know, think about the thing that you're really good at doing and think about how you can use that to help other people. And if that in any way falls into the realm of STEM, um, STEM isn't something that you're born with. It's a learned skill. So absolutely anyone can do it. Um, so use those tools to kind of, you know, pick up that skill set, gain more power and confidence into thinking about how you can translate your talent, your individual special talent um, into helping your community and the people around you. And I think that will help you lead a pretty happy and, and fulfilled life, or at least it's worked out for me so far. Yeah. Well, this has been fantastic. 
I'm, I'm grateful that I had the opportunity to interview you and I'm grateful for the people who came. I know that you have a lot of followers on social media and some of them are here. So thank you for coming to the talk. I'll turn it back over to Lauren. Hi, yes, thank you both so much for this fantastic conversation. And thank you to all of you out there for watching. Um, please do check out and purchase Biofabrication on harvard.com and on behalf of the Harvard Division of Science, the Harvard Library and Harvard Bookstore, all here in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Have a great night, keep reading and please be well. Thanks so much. Thank you.